All right, so today we move on through Matthew uh, 14, or 15 rather, and uh, we get to deal right off the bat with a, an important issue in our bibliology, our belief in what the Bible is, like our beliefs about the Bible itself. And it opens us up to an important reality that God is the creator of our brain. That's not totally surprising. God created the human body as well as everything else. He created the human mind. He created us after His image. He created us needing to learn. We don't start off as, as something from a complete blank slate perspective. There's uh, information there, but over time, it, uh, babies don't just come out talking, although that would be brilliant, right? They just come out hungry. I pooped again. You know, if they could just provide that information, it would be so much easier on the parents. But as it is, we need to learn. And how we learn is by rep repetition. I have been a musician for most of my life and teaching music largely throughout this. But the most difficult thing about learning music is that I can't just tell you what to do. I can tell you what to do, but then you have to do it over and over and over and over again. And the most frustrating thing about learning uh, music or languages or certain art, you know, things that take uh, actual skill in the, in the real world, in, it involves that repetition in order to learn how to get it right. So any good learning method doesn't just involve providing information, but involves repeating the important information over and over again. So if you've taken a really effective college class or high school class or whatever it is, if you've taken a really effective class, you will be exposed to the same information in your reading and then potentially in your lecture and then as you research for whatever papers they want you to write or so on and so forth forth, that repetition helps you understand and highlight what is important and what to see. That is how God designed us, and interestingly, we see that right here in today's passage of Scripture. So there are distinctions between this account and the feeding of the 5,000, which we saw only a few chapters, or one chapter before, sorry, in chapter 14. But the lesson is one that always needs repeating. So, uh, as we do, is our custom, we go through Scripture verse by verse as our uh, way of moving through, and, and I can't defend this enough, there's a reason for that, is that if I just get to pick and choose my favorite topics or themes from Scripture, then you don't get the full counsel of God, you just get my little perspective on it. But because we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Word of God, we're forced to look at every word ultimately over time that God has to say. It balances us out according to what God has to say, not according to any one person's uh, vision or hope or idea. And this is a, a lesson that comes with some repeating, but we have to ask, is this a repeat? So um, again, people who are uh, biblically opposed or opposed, rather, we should say, to the concepts and uh, beliefs in biblical inerrancy, that is to say that the Bible is without error, or that the Bible is the Word of God, will say that this is just an accidental repeat. In fact, it's just the same as the 5,000 uh, story, but he, he wrote it in twice uh, for some strange or unknown reason, and um, we're going to reject that hypothesis. In fact, I hope we can give you a lot of confidence in the fact that this is, these are two different accounts. These are two different events. The feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 are distinct. And you might ask, I'm ready to just accept that on faith. I'm ready to just take you, take you at your word, Brad. And uh, to that I say, no, don't do that. In fact, let's look at it together and let's prove this out and see that Matthew is um, actually being intentional and intentionally led by the Holy Spirit in this. So first of all, we notice that Matthew records these very close together. It would be one thing in the large you know, 28 chapters of this book if he had put this once towards the beginning and once towards the end. Then maybe we could say, well, you know, that's, uh, he was writing for a long time, lots of, lots of papyrus, you know, under his pen at that point. But the fact that these two accounts are within a chapter of each other, it, it, it it defies the very kindness of, with which we should 
regard any author, right? We've got to give authors the benefit of the doubt on the human form and say if there's a, a better understanding or rather we're giving them the benefit of the doubt that what they're doing is not stupid, foolish, or a mistake. And if we extend that to human authors, which you should, we certainly will def- extend this to these divinely inspired, inspired authors. Matthew putting two or putting the same account twice is absurd. Next, both Matthew and Mark record this miracle as being in Gentile territory. So both in uh, Mark 7 and here in Matthew uh, 15, we see that, uh, that, that this is now in a section having to do with Gentiles and Gentile territory uh, in general. So the both uh, situations are, are, are recorded as such. The crowd with, was with him three days in this passage, but with him only one day in the passage in Matthew 14. This pa- passage records seven loaves instead of five loaves in the previous, uh, um, previous miracle. Previously, he had told them to sit on the grass. Now, this is an interesting point that uh, many commentators hit. When he told them to sit down in groups in the previous section, it had been months earlier, kind of in what we'd call like the springtime where there was still grass. So he told them to sit on the grass. But now he tells them to sit on the earth because as we get into high summer when this would happen, probably a month later, that there would be no grass upon which to sit. So he tells them to sit on the ground. Two different events, again. Two different baskets are mentioned here, these larger baskets. In fact, you probably have this uh, recorded, uh, the baskets in this passage, as the large baskets or, again, larger baskets. So uh, the Jews would be using a, a smaller basket about this size to collect fragments, and these large baskets would be those of the Gentiles. They would be more kind of big two-handed wicker baskets that uh, would hold a great deal more. So that specificity of using the right language, in fact, using a different word uh, for, for the baskets used, shows, again, two different events. The number difference, 4,000 instead of 5,000, this one's just an obvious slam, uh, slam dunk. And then we want to point out that there are thematically very important reasons why Matthew would record this miracle for the Gentiles, right? And why they would put in such close proximity, as we're going to see, this shows Christ's care for and desire to uh, heal and provide for the Gentiles as well. That while the last section focused, on, focused, it, oh goodness, focused on, his, on, on the, the primacy and importance of his ministry to the Jewish people in order to bring salvation to the world, that he did not in any way overlook the, great, the need to bring the truth and salvation to the entire world. So all All of that is wrapped up in this and should give us all the confidence in the world that this is not just a repeat. Now, why spend all this airtime on it? Well, I view these kinds of challenges as the little foxes that come to steal your faith. It's these little questions you go, that, that as we're reading our Bibles or as we're uh, going along that might perplex us and say, well, why repeat this? Well, there is a reason. But the sad thing is, is that oftentimes we'll have an, uh, maybe an attack by some, we'll watch some secular television show or be sitting in a class or something and have someone make an allegation. Rather than check it out, we just let that little gnawing bit of, uh, of, of uh, doubt burrow into us. And every time something subverts, even in the tiniest sense, our confidence in the Word of God, we are less likely to understand and apply it to the point of subjecting our understanding and our beliefs and our perceptions to the revealed Word of God. And that is wholly unacceptable. That's why we handle the tough issues. That's why when we come up to a textual issue or a question, we uh, find the reasonable explanation for it. And it's why we don't let these little details go, although we could. Because if you are going to live under the, uh, uh, under the uh, revelation or under the authority of the revelation of the Word of God, then you need to be confident that you can trust it, right? We've told this story before, but if you ever go to a, um, a high ropes course, How much fun you have on that ropes course will be 100% dependent on how much you trust in your harness. If you believe that that harness can save you, you are going to have the best time in the world. If there's even a smidgen of doubt that you might just happen to slip out of it or that it might let you fall, you're not going to have any fun at all. And that's really the truth. 
If you are not confident in the whole counsel of God, if you're not confident that you can trust in the Word of God, that it's reliable down to the names, down to the facts, down to the historically provable points, then you are going to have trouble trusting in it and walking in the light of the Word. And that is tremendously important to us here at Fort Collins Bible Church. So that's why we uh, go about these uh, little rabbit trails, if you like, even though it's not uh, directly related to the account that we're looking at today. We want to make sure that you are confident and you know you can trust what the Word of God has to say. So with that, we've got three sections, uh, starting with Jesus' desire, moving to the disciples' dilemma, and finally into divine provisions. We'll start with Jesus' desire. It says, now Jesus called, in verse 32, his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So, Jesus calls uh, the disciples to him, and the first thing we want to note is the compassion of Jesus. We've highlighted this several times up on our uh, movement through Matthew, but we want to note that the compassion of Jesus thus far has always been directed to the Jewish people, whether individual individual otherwise. And fascinatingly, as we looked in the last uh, section of the Gentile, or the Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman, however you want to refer to her, we might have questioned Jesus' compassion. Hopefully, a clear understanding of that text showed us that that was not a, a fair thing to wonder, a correct thing to wonder, that Jesus, in fact, had incredible compassion. In fact, such compassion that He was willing to forego her immediate perceived need to assure her spiritual understanding of His Messiahship and the, the way of, as the way of salvation. So, here we have a confirmation that Jesus' compassion does not just go to His people, but goes out to this large group of non-Jewish people, to all people. And as we saw, hopefully you understood clearly in the last section, the reason why Jesus Christ came to the Jews is because that is to whom He was promised. That was the way God's plan worked, and that was His method to bring salvation to the entire world. So it wasn't as if Jesus was going, nope, I only care about these and not those. Quite to the contrary, He said, this is the way that we're going to get to the point where He rules and reigns over a world that is largely healed from the consequences of sin. And He wasn't going to be distracted from that task. Point two, these people traveled with Jesus for three days, even to the point when they're out of food. I want to just pause for a moment again. One of the features of the Gospels that we've seen is people who were so spiritually hungry, so spiritually desirous to know the Word of God, that they would walk miles upon miles, that they would abandon jobs, perhaps family members and appointments, to go and hear the Word of God as taught from Jesus' lips. And it even brings us another question. I mean, shouldn't they have planned better? Shouldn't they have brought more supplies or, or said, well, supplies are going low. Guess I better get out of here. Sorry, love to stay longer, Jesus, but we did not pack enough food. We had no idea this was going to be a three-day camping trip. It's interesting to me, at least, that they kept going until their supplies ran out. They got to the very end, and interestingly, Jesus doesn't say, you know, you guys should have really planned better. He says, because you were willing to burn everything up, and let everything go in order to hear the Word of God. He wants to send them away full and not empty, not just spiritually as they surely would have been, but physically as well. In fact, Jesus seems to commend them. He says, I do not want to send them away hungry. He doesn't want to. That's, that's interesting. Not only is He bound by His character to a certain attitude or, or um, actions in respect to humankind, but He doesn't want them to be uncomfortable. He doesn't want them to be in any physical danger. He desires for them to be physically full. And I, I think it's always worth a pause. You see, we as humans go along in our sinful nature right, apart from salvation, before we're saved, or you know, if you remember that time, and we know intuitively that there's something in us that is offensive 
to the righteousness and holiness of God. We rightfully come to a recognition that there's something in us that has made or makes God angry, that makes us deserving of His wrath or His punishment. We recognize that because of the sin within us. And we can be confused and think, as the pagans do, that, the God, that God is arbitrary or angry or hateful as a part of His disposition. But God hates no man. He longs for the salvation of all. And His intent, as displayed here, is for their good. He doesn't want to send them away hungry. The God of the universe doesn't have a negative attitude towards the believer particularly, but a positive one. And yet, it can still be difficult in our psychology, our thinking, to break over or break through that barrier that was once true because one point our sin stood between us and the holy God, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that sin stands no more because He took away the barrier between Him and us. Now we can experience the true positive desire of God. Now, I'm not saying that God desires you to have everything you want. In fact, that would be horrifying. But what is absolutely true is that God does desire the very best for you. But I challenge you, do you walk in faith of that reality? When you think about God's attitude towards you, do you believe it's truly for the very best for you? Or do you believe that He is working against you, putting stones in your way or throwing uh, <laughs> problems in your path? Or do you trust in His plan? Well, Jesus here shows that positive desire. He wants to send them away full and not empty, and He cares for their physical health. He was not just, uh, you know, aloof and floating above everything and saying, well, I put some great information in your mind. He cares for their physical health. He cares for their whole being. So that gives us Jesus' desire. The next thing we see is the disciples' dilemma. And his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? So here we have the same problem with the same questions being asked. I want you to notice that these events probably as, as little as a month later, maybe, maybe a few months apart, and the disciples pose the same challenges. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it fascinating? Like, you just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, and yet you're, they're still wondering, well, I mean, yeah, He did it once. Can He do it twice? Will He do it twice? We see it again. We learn slowly. We learn by repetition. Most of us will have lived most of our lives in a society where with almost nothing you can go into a, uh, a grocery store or a restaurant and have a full belly within minutes. Most of us will have not known uh, what it's like to miss meals, but the people of the New Testament era knew what it was like to miss meals. They knew what it was like to be starving and to be hungry. They knew what it was like to look, and desire, look for and desire food but not have any around. So these feeding miracles had such a profound impact on the early faiths of these people because it was something that they could hardly imagine and it was something that all humans needed. Maybe that's why it was difficult for the disciples, even though Jesus had very recently done something similar. Maybe that's why it was so hard for them to get together. But also, it points out that Jesus brings the disciples to a place of recognizing their own inability to solve the problem. That's a big deal. It's kind of fascinating to me that the, Jesus, uh, that the, Jesus, the disciples did not assume that Jesus would do what He had done the last time again. Maybe they didn't assume he would do that because this was now a Gentile audience. It was a different group. Maybe they didn't assume that because they thought, well, you know, that maybe it just doesn't work all the time. But either way, they would have been painfully cognizant of the fact that while they distributed the bread and the feeding of the 5,000, they did not multiply the loaves of fish. 
They were painfully aware of the fact that whatever had happened before, they hadn't been the ones to do it. And it took them coming to the end of their ability to be able to surrender the situation over to Jesus and say, we were out. And can I encourage you by way of uh, indirect application or inference that your life may not be so different on the day to day. There will be situations in your life, maybe even daily, where you're brought to the end of what you have to offer, where you come to the end of your ability, where you come to the, uh, uh, an absolute stop or block on where you, know, where you know you should go or what you think you should do, and you're just forced to sit there and say, Lord, I, I can only trust you. This situation's impossible for me. Might I commend to you that while uncomfortable and maybe even undesirable at points, this is the best place to be. The recognition that when we come to the end of ourselves, we're finally ready to trust in what He has provided for us. And the interesting thing is, is that while it often takes dramatic and difficult situations to bring us to that point, if we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll eventually learn to live in that place. Stop looking to our own ways. Stop looking to our own solutions. Stop fussing over our own uh, desires and goals. And finally, just recognize that God's plan is bigger or as uh, Solomon would write, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You're going to get to that place. But we get a choice into how. You can choose to trust Him today, before the trial or the struggle comes, or we can wait until then and learn the hard way. But things will get so much better when we're in a place of trusting in Him, trusting in His Word, His perception, what He's declared, His promises above our best desires. So with that, we move into the final uh, section here of the divine provision. You see, God reveals His will and then provides the means to fulfill it. God is, and God's Word, is filled with impossible tasks for humans to fulfill right? We have the story of Abram and Sarah. God promises Abram, Abraham, later Abram, land, seed, and blessing. And they do everything that they can. They're doing everything that they can, waiting and hoping upon God to provide that seed, that heir, that promise, and time keeps passing, and time keeps passing, and they keep not having a child. And so they, they make a plan. They say, well, our Elias are the slave. He's going to be the, 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 I guess, in some sense, the, the one who fulfills God's promise, and they worry and they concern, and then they pass the age where they're going to be able to conceive, and they, or where Sarah's able to conceive, or at least they perceive. And they decide to take matters into their own hands, and uh, Sarah gives over her handmaid, Hagar, to Abram or to Abraham and causes all sorts of problems. Can you blame them? Did God give them a promise or was it a command? It was a promise, but maybe they were supposed to help out. Maybe they were supposed to be doing more to get it done. And when they did try to get it done by their own means, by going outside of the marriage, one of God's divine institutions, by going after some cultural custom for adoption or for, you know, bringing forth a child. They only brought difficulty into their lives and, yes, difficulty into the world because they were unwilling to wait on God's promise. Finally, when all hope was extinguished, when all chance of saying that there was some human portion in this or human part of this plan, God provides Isaac as a miracle. And as a continuation of that miracle, he so invigorates Sarah's body that she's able to nurse him and care for him as would be almost nonsensical uh, from a human physical perspective. And why? Because God gets the credit. It's not a story about how amazing Abraham is. It's not a story about how great Sarah is. It's a story about how God's plan is marked 
with His supernatural hand from the very earliest days and steps. We see the same principle with Elijah at Mount Carmel, right? He steps forward and challenges the prophets of Baal, even taunting them as this incredible show, uh, showdown between gods is taking place. And yes, Elijah has admirable faith, but it is God who brought the fire down from heaven. What God commands, He provides for. And that especially applies to the most important miracle that he'll, he'll do in your lives. Not only has He given you His salvation by grace through faith, but He has told you that you'll be conformed to the image of Christ. He's commanded us in 2 Peter 3.18 to grow. Well, grow. How? By what means? He's provided the perfect means. He's given us His grace provisions for success. When it comes to Christian, the Christian life, God has provided everything. He provided His Son, Jesus Christ. And when you trust in Him, you are identified with Him in His death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating at the right hand of the Father. You are able to walk in newness of life with absolute confidence and conviction that you are seated with Him at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities and powers, rulers, and authorities of this world. You are given a perfect position in Him, and you are told to believe or to live with the confidence that what He's declared you to be, that you are. But not only that, He's given you His Holy Spirit. He has personally, permanently indwelt you, and the Holy Spirit is constantly working through His ministries of conviction, of anointing, of guiding, of teaching, of directing, of moving in your life and situation, internally giving you all that is needed for this continued growth and movement. But not just that, He's given you His Word. He's given you the very mind of Christ, which He's opened up and is available to you to know God's character, who He is, what He's done, and to know what He desires for you. There's not a lot of questions. Someone uh, once said, as I grow older, I'm less interested in the white space in Scripture as I am in the black space. In other words, I'm not interested in what God didn't say or what uh, arguments we can have about the, the questions that we might have about God's Word, and I'm more interested in what He did say and what He did reveal, because what He did reveal is your peace and your portion forever. You don't need to sit around wondering what the will of God is. It's revealed to you in His wonderful Word, and it's living and active. It's powerful. To affect change. Not only that, He's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you, uh, in your new life in Christ, the ability to serve the body of Christ, to edify the body of Christ, and that means also that you'll be edified by other spiritual gifts, gifts of mercy, gifts of hospitality, gifts of teaching, gifts that help administrate and and keep the body of Christ together and growing, gifts of evangelism. The Word of God is brought forth and applied to us, and you're part of it, and others are part of it. It's why that this whole Christian homework assignment, which God has given us through Jesus Christ, it's not a solo mission. As we said last week, it's not a one-player game something that we need to work together. So He's given us His body. He's given us the church. He's given us one another. And that means that if you want to enjoy it, you need to be here. You've got to build relationships with with each other. It's not just a church is not uh, a group of people all identified with or, or seeking after the attention of the pastor. A church is a group, a family of people who are connected one with another. Finally, although it's really not finally, it's a short list, He's given you constant access to Him in prayer. We take it for granted probably if you were raised or if you've been a Christian for many years, but we really shouldn't. I mean, you can, uh, there's actually, I think, a website that you can go complain to the White House You can go write a little complaint email and you say whatever you want in that little box. You can send it in. And I'm pretty sure that if you like got into the code, that send button, it's a delete button. 
Because I guarantee you, no one in the government gives a rip what you have to say. But the God of the universe, He cares. He hears every word. He hears every prayer. But He doesn't just hear it. He listens and understands because His Holy Spirit is within you, part of that connection and communication. And God answers prayer and God honors prayer. God has given you everything that you need, as Peter would say, for life and godliness. He's given you an impossible task if you tried to do it yourself. But if you rely upon the provisions which He has laid out for you, you'll find it's not impossible at all because it's Him doing it. And that's why at the end of this great age, all the rewards that the believer accrues will be laid down at the feet of Jesus because at the end of the day, it will be Him who did it and it will be Him who gets the glory. And that's a wonderful thing. So Jesus then uh, responds by saying, how many loaves do you have? He said seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and fish and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples. And his disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. They took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. He sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came, and came to the region of Magdala. The question is then left to be, or he asks, what do we have to work with? What do we got going on? You see, I think this is really an interesting thing because Jesus asked them to locate food to start off this miracle. It's wild. Jesus could have rained down bread from heaven. He did that before, literally. In, in the Old Testament, right? He, he made manna rain from heaven. you telling me he couldn't do that again? Of course he could. It would have been no trouble to his divine uh, ability. And yet, he asks them, hey, go, sign, go find us something to start with. Go find us some loaves. How many loaves and fish do we have? And so they have the, uh, these seven loaves and these two fish. He invites them to be involved with what he's doing. He doesn't have to. He could have come up with uh, unspeakable numbers of other possibilities to feed this crowd. But instead, he chooses to involve his disciples. There's at least two reasons for this. One is by involving them, they are learning. One of the greatest methods or ways to teach is to teach not just by telling, but by showing and involving others, letting them do it or teach one. <laughs> what is it? You learn one, you do one, you teach one, <laughs> whatever method that is. He involved them. He kept them involved and invested in what he was doing, not just making them receptacles for information, but making them participants in the miraculous work and evidence of his messiahship, of his divinity, and of his his ultimate legitimacy as their Savior. And we must say again, is that how you view ministry? I've heard a troubling number of people not in our church, um, so don't look around and think, was it me? It wasn't you. <laughs> I've heard a troubling number of people in recent months say, when I ask, how's your ministry? Say, well, I don't really have a ministry. I get it. You mean you're not in vocational ministry, but nothing could be more wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you live on this planet, if you are a vessel of the Holy Spirit, if you are recreated or if you are a new creation in Jesus Christ, then you have a ministry. You might say, it's very small. I'm confined to this bed and the only person I see is the nurse who comes and helps uh, care to my most base physical needs. Your ministry extends only to one other eternal soul made in, in the image of God that will go, to go on into all eternity, either with God or apart from Him. And we'd call that a small ministry. How absurd. And then you think most of us in this room 
we'll probably see 50, maybe even hundreds of people this week. Hundreds of people to pray for. Hundreds of people to care for. Hundreds of people whom you can, to whom you can reach out, to whom you can show and perhaps open up an opportunity to have a real spiritual discussion that they might know the word and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't have a ministry. Don't say that. You have a tremendous ministry. Just by being saved, just by having trusted in Jesus Christ and existing in this world, you exist as a container for the restrainer that holds back evil in this world for this poor time. You are a part of God's eternal plan and glory. And that's not something you have to do. That's something that you get to be involved in. That's a privilege beyond measure beyond understanding. Over the years as a bagpiper, I've had the opportunity to participate in various uh, uh, memorial services for soldiers or for military uh, veterans and the like. We don't ask for money for a gig like that. It's a privilege to get to participate and honor those people who have given their lives for our freedom and our country's uh, history and future. Similarly, serving the Lord is not a have to, it's a get to. It's an opportunity to be useful. Though He didn't need you, you get to be a part of it. It says, those who ate were filled. Again, the completeness of this miracle. It's not as if everybody just got a little nibble. Everybody was full and ready to walk home these seven baskets of leftovers might sound less, but again, these are much larger baskets that are being collected. But we do want to point out, as, as many great uh, commentators do in this passage, even though God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is able to make bread out of nothing if it needed to be, there's no excuse to waste anything. Isn't that interesting? I just find that very fascinating, that even though Jesus uh, could, could afford to be abundant and liberal with the miraculous provision of food uh, as, as beyond our imagination, still collected and saved and was responsible with those things that came about. That's a really interesting, uh, I think, directive for us in the church. Though the Lord is, uh, will provide for absolutely everything that this church body truly needs to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and to do the work of proclaiming the gospel and standing for the word of God in this present evil age, there is no excuse for us to be flippant or wasteful with the resources that he does provide. That's why I praise God for the, the group of, of deacons and those of us who uh, utilize responsibility and care in the things that the Lord has given well, our uh, story ends with him being off to Magdala. I'm going to pull up the little laser pointer here for just a moment so we can see where Magdala is. Now, uh, essentially in this passage, we would have seen Jesus go up and north to Tyre and Sidon over here, le seemingly come back to this area, and then Magdala is this little red dot right here. So uh, whether they skipped across or skipped down around the, the sea or, or went directly across, which seems less likely, they wound up in Magdala. They're back in Jewish territory. So as we finish chapter 15 in the book of Matthew in this long study, by the way, 50th, uh, 50th study in Matthew, well done, you for getting so far. Uh, we have six points from Warren Wearsby that I couldn't, uh, couldn't overlook. They were just too good. We had to share them. Now, keep in mind, these aren't just from this passage. They're from the entirety of Matthew 15. He said, one, the enemies of truth are often religious people who live according to man's traditions. Satan often uses religion to bind the minds of sinners to the simple truths of God's Word. This, of course, is looking back to the uh, beginning of this chapter and the uh, Pharisees' demand that Jesus honor the legalism and the tradition and the religion that had been created not by God but by them and their uh, fathers or their uh, forebears in that rabbinic tradition. Satan still uses religion to this day to keep hearts from simple faith in Jesus Christ. 
might we be mindful and attentive and humble to see what traditions might be interfering with our faith in Him. We must be aware that any religious system that gives us an excuse to sin and disobey God's Word, boy, we can't speak highly enough of this point. Be mindful. We, have come, we are just experts at coming up with loopholes, coming up with little uh, excuses as to why God's Word doesn't apply or why this would ordinarily be a sin, but when we do it, it's not, or why this attitude is completely acceptable in my case because you didn't see what he did, or why, and on and on and on. Might we be painfully aware when we're equivocating or when we're using some religious uh, thinking to get out or get away or escape from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Three, we must also be aware of worship that comes from the lips only and not from the heart. Number four, if we major in the, on the inner man, the outer man will be what God wants it to be. True holiness comes from within. Isn't that a tremendous point? You see, man-made religion always focuses on the externals. Do this, don't do this, start this, stop that, more of this, less of that. Do better, work harder. But the true biblical faith focuses on what's going on internally between you and Christ and lets true godliness flow from within. Five, it is difficult to break free from tradition. There is something in us that wants to hold to the past and make no changes. Even Peter had to learn this lesson twice. Six, we dare not limit Christ to any one nation or people. The gospel came to the Jew first, but today is for all men in all nations. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever. Chances are that you're not looking at anyone in your life, or at least I hope, and saying, well, they're not Jewish, so they're, I don't need to share the gospel with them. They'd never accept it. It's probably not where you're drawing lines, like Jesus or the Matthew's original audience might be tempted to draw a line. But we probably draw lines in other places. Oh, well, they're Hindu or Muslim. They already have a faith. Why talk to them about Jesus? They're already taken. Oh my goodness, the way she lives, she'd never accept. She'd never accept Christ. Oh, that person, well, they, they're a, insert political party here. No use talking to them about Christ. Where do you draw imaginary lines? Because the great thing is, is you don't need to con conform anyone to your political party. That's a useless waste of time. You don't need to change the outward behaviors of any given sinner. That would be a waste of time. They need Jesus Christ. They need to trust in His perfect sacrifice for sin. That's what they need. Everything goes forward from there, and nothing goes forward apart from that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, how we thank you and we praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the great gift of your word, of your love, of your life. Please, O oh Lord, be glorified in this humble body of believers. Might we listen to your word. Might we understand your character. Might we understand your love for us, and in so knowing that, respond by loving you, by listening to and obeying your word, by, by willingly participating joyously in the honor of being able to minister with you. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen.